Today, we're going to build on our knowledge of the primate family tree. Already, we've gained insight into the human origins by looking at the field of primatology. But in this lecture, we're going to turn to paleoanthropology to trace our earliest human ancestors through to modern Homo sapiens. And like primatology, paleoanthropology will give us some great perspective as we explore answers to our foundational anthropology question, who are we? Where do we come from? We're going to be talking about a story that it's about 7 million years old. So let's first grab a little perspective because it's kind of hard to grasp timelines that include millions of years, right? So let's use a straightforward metaphor to get some perspective on the origins of humanity. Think of a clock, right? Not a 12-hour clock, but a 24-hour clock. And if we take the entire past 4.5 billion years since the Earth was created, and if we jammed all those years into a single 24-hour day, what time do you think humans would emerge? When should our human history start? Some might say 4 a.m. with the origins of life, but then it's really not until late in the afternoon, almost dinner time, about 5.30ish, when we get the first multicellular organisms. It's not till 11 p.m. till we even see dinosaurs. So if this triceratops, if, if they merge around 11 p.m., when do we humans show up? Well, you'll be surprised to hear it's at 11.58 and 43 seconds. And again, that's p.m. Just about a minute and change before midnight. So our 24-hour clock shows us where the story of our origins fit within the meta story of our planet Earth. And it's clear we are recent arrivals on a vastly ancient planet. And when I reflect on the magnitude of the ecological, the cultural, and the biological inheritance that each and every one of us is born into, the human story, and our place in the universe, well, they become all the more magnificent and perhaps, depending on your worldview, even a little magical. So let's recap our timing here. As humans, we are earthlings, and the earth is 4.5 billion years old. So in some ways, our story could begin there. Or we're mammals, so we could start about 200 million years ago with the earliest of those. But in our previous lecture, we went back 63 million years ago to the most recent common ancestor that we share with all modern primates. So today, let's get right to that human branch of our tree that's going to diverge from our closest primate cousins right around 7 million years ago. From a paleoanthropology point of view, the moment our ancestors started walking on two feet, that moment demarcates our human origins as primates. Paleoanthropologists are the human origin specialists in the anthropology family. They search for paleoecological evidence, namely fossil evidence, to reveal details about the lives and biology of the earliest humans. And it's from this fossil evidence, and without spoiling the story of our ancestors, uh, paleoanthropologists, they teach us that the earliest apes who started walking upright, they lived around seven million years ago, and slowly, over time, hominins, upright walking apes who are direct ancestors to us humans, well, they evolved into modern humanity. Now, along the way, we're going to see that the way we walk, that's going to transform our bodies, uh, from the size of our brains to the shape of our pelvis. And when we finally start making stone tools some 2.5 million years ago, things are really going to start to change. Now, think about that, just that. In 2.5 million years, we went from stone tools to Wi-Fi and hoverboards. But wait, let's slow this down just a minute here. Let's get right to our origins with Sahelanthropus. So come with me now to the Jurab Desert in Chad, and it's here in Central Africa where we're going to find Michael or Michel Brunet and his team with a game-changing paleoanthropological discovery. Right? After decades of work in places like Afghanistan and Cameroon, Brunei and his team, they went to Chad, and they unearthed a famous fossil that is certainly one of the earliest hominins on the human family tree. Now, this takes us back to 2001, when Brunei's team discovered the remains of a primate skull that dates back approximately six to seven million years. 
Now, to make, t make some sense of that time frame, um, we could count back in time, year by year, one second at a time, right? If we counted down those years, one second at a time, it would take us about 11.5 weeks to get there. No sleep, no pauses, one second equals one year, 11.5 weeks. Now, Brunet's skull, it's commonly referred to as Tumai, or its scientific name, TM266-01-06. You know, bottom line, let's just say TM266 for short. Um, TM266 ends up being identified as Sahelanthropus chadensis, or, if we translate that, Sahelian human from Chad. Now, this nearly complete skull's fractured surface still plainly reveals prominent wide raised brow and its canine teeth were smaller than other apes who have longer canines for making those scowling threats and for fighting, right? Now, this weathered skull, it's aged to the point it almost looks like driftwood in the shape of a jawless skull. But despite its age, TM-266 and Sahelanthropus chadensis, they're remarkable because they date back to the same time frame that we separated from the chimpanzees and bonobos. It fits the timeline. And they were distinct from all other primates except our human line. This early primate, right, was likely a facultative biped. Or in other words, to one degree or another, it walked on two feet. And ultimately, it's our oldest known primate ancestor whose fossil remains indicate that it was bipedal. And that's where we started our human story, right, with these earliest walking upright apes. But hold on just a minute here. How in the world can someone look at a skull like the Tamai skull and determine if it walked on two feet? Well, that's classic paleoanthropology and primatology. See, when all we have is just a skull, one major indicator for bipedalism can be seen in a thing called the foramen magnum. Now, that's the place where the skull meets the spine. So if you take a look at a gorilla, a modern gorilla or a chimpanzee, its foramen magnum, well, it's actually towards the rear of the skull, not the center, as with humans, right? So it's kind of like a lollipop with a stick towards the side of the candy instead of us right in the middle. And one bi biological outcome of our transition to bipedalism is that our spine, well, it's more centrally located where it connects to the skull. Us bipeds, we have a more centrally located foramen magnum that our non-human primate relatives do not. Ultimately, Brunet and his colleagues argue that this fossil is actually one of our earliest bipedal ancestors, close to the time we split from chimpanzees and bonobos. We haven't found anything, nothing bipedal anywhere that is older than this discovery. So you can imagine, there are some people who might challenge Brunet's conclusions. I mean, some actually think that Sahelanthropus was more of a peripheral human ancestor, and, and others, they challenge both of these arguments because of, frankly, a dearth of any other evidence. I mean, we have plenty of fossils out there to tell the story of our human origins, just not so many that date back seven million years. So, remember, anthropology is testable and correctable, uh, so we're going to continue to challenge these hypotheses as we discover more of the fossil record, but in the meantime, Let's go to a starting point that most everyone can agree on, and that's going to be Artipithecus, right? So let's stay in Africa, and this time we're going to go east from Chad towards Ethiopia, and we can actually meet other paleoanthropologists who discovered one of the earliest known fossils of our human ancestors. My friends, meet Dr. Timothy White and Berhain Asfa. Beginning in the early 1990s, Asphalt and White's team began uncovering some extremely fragile fossil remains. I mean, they were so delicate that it took 15 years to preserve and analyze what they found. They even had to use CT scans to make it easier to piece all these things together, right? I mean, the wait was worth it. Their results were groundbreaking. They had discovered the remains of early ancestors, human ancestors, who lived over four million years ago. Their major find was the skeletal remains of a female who lived 4.4 million years ago. She was bipedal, uh, but she could get around in the trees as well. I mean, scientists, they, dis they dubbed this new discovery Artipithecus ramidus, 
uh, which in the local Afar language, um, Ardi is ground, um, and, and Ramid, that means root. So really what we're talking about is ground ape root, right? The ground ape root. Let's stick with the name Ardi, just uh, for easy sake. Um, how does Ardi compare with modern humans? Well, she was barely 100 pounds. She stood up about mm, four feet tall. I mean, she even had a reduced canine tooth, which is one of the ways our human ancestors started to differentiate themselves from other apes on our unique evolutionary path. But remember, anthropology, it's a science. That means testable and correctable, right? So as such, anthropologists have continued to test and correct our understanding of Artipithecus and all our human ancestors. And so it was, it was 1990s, it was in the 1990s uh, and, and into the new century that Johannes Haile Selassie discovered more fossil evidence of Artipithecus in Ethiopia. In fact, the remains that he unearthed were confirmed as part of the Artipithecus classification. However, they were older. They lived around five and a half million years ago. And so they named this early human ancestor Artipithecus Kadaba, because Kadaba means oldest ancestor in the local Afar language. So if we're looking to make a family portrait wall, right, of our major human ancestors, then we'll certainly include both Artipithecus Ramidus and Artipithecus Kadaba, because they're great representatives of our earliest bipedal ancestors. But wait a second. How do we know all this to be true? How do humans go about making sense of bones and other remains from millions of years ago? Well, from time to time, humans have found fossils that beg further inquiry. Take Raymond Dart, for example. Dart, he was a professor of anatomy living in South Africa in the early 20th century. And one day, Dart, he came across a captivating fossil. It was a skull with a jawbone, and it was a remarkable skull, because it was relatively complete, and Dart knew something was a little off with this find. I mean, he looked at it and he said, this is clearly not a human, at least not a modern human. But it sure wasn't any other modern ape he knew of. So the skull, it was smaller than a human skull, larger than a chimpanzee. What was it? Well, the skull was named the Tong Child. Tong, because of the town in South Africa where it was found by quarry workers in 1924 and child because, well, as it turns out, this poor chap died as a kid, and we're pretty sure that he died as a result of an eagle attack. Um, Dart proposed that we classify the skull as Australopithecus africanus, translated as southern ape from Africa, and distinct from humans and the other primates, southern apes, or Australopithecine, they represent a whole other major era on our evolutionary timeline and our evolutionary tree. But remember what we anthropologists do. We test and correct our ideas. And that means that once Dart comes up with this intermediate ancestor theory about Australopithecus, we've got to test it. And that we did over and over again. And in the case of the Tong Child discovery and Dart's theory that it represents a major moment in our evolutionary path, well, anthropologists challenged and tested these ideas rigorously because at first, many were skeptical of the idea that Australopithecus was a direct human ancestor. But over the decades, more and more fossils emerged to support the theory that at least some Australopithecines were indeed our direct Homo sapiens ancestor. Ultimately, we learned that these Australopithecines lived some four million years ago and they're only found in Africa, and mainly Eastern Africa. And there were many, many types, right? Uh, remember our friend, the Tong Child? Uh, well, we found out that he was definitely an upright walking ape, but he wasn't the type of Australopithecus that's directly related to us Homo sapiens. But don't worry, we found other versions of Australopithecus. Australopithecus afarensis, for example. Now, they are definitely our direct ancestors. And while quite similar and members of the same genus, Australopithecus africanus, that's the Tong child, they split from Australopithecus afarensis because they started down their own evolutionary path. And our direct Homo sapien ancestors, they did the same. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this next celebrity hominin before. 
She's perhaps the most famous of all the Australopithecines, Afarensis, Africanus, all of them. Now, here's a hint. Think the Beatles, something about a sky, diamonds, right? Uh, Lucy, Lucy. She was an Australopithecus afarensis, and they are our direct human ancestors. Her discovery in 1974 was celebrated widely because it is so rare to find such an old, yet relatively complete, preserved skeleton. And rumor has it that the team named the skeleton Lucy as the Beatles and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds played through the team's celebration of their discovery. So let's recap. Where are we on the evolutionary path towards modern humanity? We started some seven million years ago when our ancestors became those strange, upright walking members of the primate order. And our earliest fossil records of bipedal ancestors from after the point we diverged from chimpanzees and bonobos, well, it was that skull, right? The skull and chad of Sahelanthropus chadensis. Next, we discovered another key ancestor, Artipithecus, who lived 4.5 million years ago. And last, we met Australopithecus, and we figured out that as a genus, they come in different forms, multiple species, some of which are direct human ancestors, while others, well, they found their own evolutionary paths separate from the hominin line that leads directly to you and me and all modern humanity. Before we fill in the gap between Australopithecus and Homo sapiens, Let's just take a moment to observe a few basic changes that, over the course of millions of years, transformed who we are as humans. In particular, let's take note of a couple key trends as we move closer and closer towards Homo sapiens. First, Sahelanthropus, through to Homo sapiens, we're going to see remarkable growth of our brain. Sahelanthropus and Artipithecus, they had brains that were 400 cubic centimeters or smaller. And that's going to contrast with the 1,350 cubic centimeter brains that you and I are using to make sense of this lecture today. Second, uh, we eventually distinguish ourselves as unique primates by walking upright, as well as our ability to make tools. So wait, spoiler number one. As we continue this story, our brains are going to get bigger and bigger from around 400 cubic centimeters to even as high as 1,450 cubic centimeters as recent as 20 to 30,000 years ago. And spoiler alert too, our tools and our tool making, they're just gonna get better and better the closer we get to Homo sapiens. Just as Raymond Dart analyzed that Tong child fossil and concluded it did not fit any existing classification, the same thing happened to the famous paleoanthropologist Mary and Louis Leakey. In the early 1960s, before we found Lucy, but well after we had established an extensive fossil record of Australopithecus, the Leakeys, they found the remains of an early human that, well, caught their attention. It wasn't a modern human, but it wasn't an Australopithecus either. It was somewhere in between the two, right? Its brain and body was a little larger, they were a little larger, and it, it lived a little more recently than our Australopithecus ancestors. And for these and other reasons, those leakies, they did what Dart did almost a half a century earlier. They created a new intermediary classification, one that clarifies our path from Sahelanthropus to Homo sapien. Additional discoveries throughout East Africa affirm the status of this newly revealed ancestor, Homo habilis, translated, handy human. So as we done at each phase of our human origin story, let's add Homo habilis to our hominin family tree. And since the Leakeys first theorized about Homo habilis, many more fossils have been found, but they are all found in Africa, right? So that means it's apparent that our early ancestors they were all still exclusively living in Africa. Our knowledge of Homo habilis, it's clear. We know they lived in Africa about two and a half million years ago, that their brain size, now note the number, it had grown to around 750 cubic centimeters. Now remarkably, we find Homo habilis remains with very crude stone tools, something we had yet to find with any other ancestor, including Artipithecus. So more recently, 
a new generation of leaky paleoanthropology has taken root. And in 2012, Maeve Leakey, the daughter-in-law of Lewis and Mary Leakey, well, she discovered fossil remains in Eastern Africa, and she argues that the fossils, quote, confirm the presence of two contemporary species of early humans. Now, what she's arguing here is that we may need to break down the Homo habilis category into two subcategories. Others, like Timothy White, who discovered Artipithecus ramidus, if you'll remember, uh, they disagree because he believes that the fossil record does not yet warrant the creation of a completely new branch of the human family tree. You know, for the rest of us, we can review the evidence as new fossils emerge to help us finish this story. But for now, I want you to see that despite our neat and tidy review of these six major human ancestors, the actual path from one to the next, well, it's far more complicated than our abbreviated history may make it seem. The next ancestor that we'll add to our timeline and family tree is Homo erectus. Uh, the first known Homo erectus discovery was actually found in 1891 by a Dutch surgeon, uh, Eugene Dubois, who clearly saw it wasn't human like you and me. So, like Dart and the Leakeys, Dubois created a whole new classification for his ape-like skull discovery. He called it Pithecanthropus erectus, ape who stands erect. And later fossils, they filled in the gap of our knowledge, and eventually, paleoanthropologists modified the name of this ancestor to Homo erectus. Now, to get to the first Homo erectus populations, we're going just under two million years ago, not, not too long since the emergence of Homo habilis. And nonetheless, we can see why paleoanthropologists established yet another classification for our human family ancestors. These Homo erectus folks, they were different, man. First, their cranial capacity, it could exceed 1,000 cubic centimeters. And remember, we started at around 400 some. This is clearly a major leap beyond Homo habilis. Second, the timeline for erectus is much closer yet to our Homo sapien origins, less than two million years ago. Third, these ancestors, they had quite an amazing toolkit compared with everyone who came before them. So rather than like basic Alduan choppers that Homo erectus were making, more than sophisticated tools were getting sharper and more specialized for the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. The evolution of tools, however, is actually getting us into archaeology, so we'll return to these tools in a future lecture. Uh, and quite significantly, back to Homo erectus, for the first time since we started this history, we can find Homo erectus or hominins outside of Africa. Some scientists, they separate the Homo erectus populations into three distinct groups based on their geographic distribution. Like there's Homo ergaster from Africa, Homo erectus in Asia, Homo heidelbergensis from Europe. And well, as we move forward, let's just remember two major lessons from Homo erectus and their phase of the human story. First, until Homo erectus, we do not see any human relatives outside of Africa, period. We don't have any compelling toolkits either. But Homo erectus changes all of that. Essentially, they're the ones that paved the way for our next and final group in our lineage. And it might sound familiar, Homo sapiens. So, my dear friends, here we are. After millions of years of evolution, we find ourselves on the verge of Homo sapiens, right? The timeline sure has sped up, if you've noticed. And think about where we've been. 63 million years ago, right, we're sharing all our ancestors with modern primates. Starting around 7 million years ago, Sahelanthropus emerged, but later died out by the time Artie comes around. Then Artie shows up 5.5 million years ago, but they also faded away after just a couple million years. I mean, it was approximately 4 million years ago that Australopithecus roamed the Earth, but again, like all previous ancestors, they only lived in Africa. But around 2.5 million years ago, Homo habilis came forth, and they worked out how to make some basic tools. And they, too, faded out. But some 2 million years ago, finally, living alongside Homo habilis for a while, Homo erectus rears his head around 1.9 million years ago and then goes extinct, well, as recently as 150,000 years ago. 
So that's our prehistory. Somewhere out of that Homo erectus population, we emerge as Homo sapiens 1.0, or Homo sapiens archaic. We understand our Homo sapien roots by dividing that phase of our history into two parts, the archaic and the modern periods. Now, the archaic form of Homo sapiens, they first came into our fossil record, well, when our friends, the Leakeys, found some Homo sapien remains dated to about 100,000 years ago. But that was, a, that was 1967, and more contemporary teams, they've revisited those same exact fossils and the site. And with their more modern technologies, they dated these early Homo sapiens to actually more like 190,000 years ago. So the most celebrated fossils from these Homo sapien line, the archaic version, are what we call the Homo skulls. And they definitely are our oldest known Homo sapien fossils, at least for now. As of yet, we've only found early Homo sapien fossils in Eastern Africa, leading us to believe that modern humans are likely rooted to a population of Homo sapiens who lived in Africa before spreading out to other continents. And we'll look at this migration closely in our next lecture. But for now, let's wrap our overview of the story of human evolution by looking at modern Homo sapiens and how we differ from our early ancestors. There are four major takeaways from the transition of our ancestors from early hominin to Homo sapiens. First, brain capacity. It expanded to 1,450 cubic centimeters, though we started at less than 400. And in the past 30,000 years, our brains have actually gotten a little smaller. These days, the average adult male cranial capacity is around 1,350 cubic centimeters. Second, very sophisticated pre-industrial tools and weapons. We make those, no one else did. Third, regional adaptations. Those are gonna lead to differences like skin color. And last, fourth, we are racially one, and we're the only remaining hominin species left on Earth, Homo sapiens. Now, those are all themes for our future lectures, but to solidify everything we've learned today, let's see one final example of our evolutionary history and the value of anthropology's test and correct ethos, and I promise it's a quick one. Now, as we saw today, the storyline was fairly simple. After evolving right along with some of the other apes, we hominins eventually take our own distinct evolutionary path as upright walking humans. Now, the fossil records, primatology, and genetics, they all concur that this threshold to humanity opened some seven million years ago. And in the seven million years since we started this journey, our story has been relatively simple. Our brains and bodies got bigger as time moved on. Our tools improved rapidly once we developed them. And they apparently helped us avoid the fate of all other hominins, extinction. So, we stood upright, we got bigger brains, got cooler tools, and eventually took over the world. <laughs> yeah, that's truish, but don't forget, this is anthropology. We're never satisfied with stagnant theories. We test and retest our ideas to improve our knowledge. And as that new evidence emerges, we gleefully reconcile it with the existing theories revising our story of human evolution. Now, one recent test and correct challenge we've dealt with recently is, uh, well, it relates to J.R. Tolkien's Hobbit. And, well, not really the Hobbit, but it's a small human that lived in Indonesia within the past 20,000 years or so. After the bones of this small yet very recent human were discovered in 2003, the popular press labeled it a Hobbit. Now, the scientific name was Homo flores siensis because their remains were found on the island of Flores, Indonesia. Um, specifically, what we found? Well, it was a population of very small, like one meter tall humans, and they not only had a complex toolkit, but they lived long after we thought every other hominin species but Homo sapiens had gone extinct. And they had relatively small brains for being such amazing tool makers. The Hobbit, well, it messes up our clean storyline of better tools through bigger brains as the road to survival as well as that old idea about us being the sole remaining hominins for the past 40,000 years. So, so what do we do with such a find? Well, 
we deal with it. We make sense of it. So for now, most folks tend to keep our hominin evolution storyline intact by subscribing to one of two theories. Some people argue that the small humans, well, they were smaller simply because of a genetic condition that emerged in the region and remained isolated, while a second theory states that on a small island with limited resources, larger animals like humans, well, they would eventually evolve to become smaller to better compete for limited resources. Regardless, the fossil record is clear, and it's deep. Walking upright appears to have been a game changer for us. And in many ways, we can consider bipedalism as the foundation of our humanity, biological and otherwise. We'll continue our anthropological journey with a closer look at our early human toolkit to retrace humanity's expansion out of Africa.